John is out here in the wilderness baptizing. Jesus comes out to him. John reveals him to be the Christ. Jesus helps out John a little bit until that becomes a hindrance to John. So Jesus sets off for Galilee, but before he does, he has to pass through Samaria. And that's where we find ourselves for right now, although by the end of today, he'll be in Galilee. Morning, all. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you have revealed yourself not only to your own people, but to the nations, that all of us may know you. You've sent your your servants into the world. You've You've given them your spirit so that all of us may know of you, of your love, of your works, of your gospel. Uh, By that same Spirit, then, open to us the Scriptures that we may know you all the more and cling to you in faith. Amen. So when we left off last week, Jesus was talking with this woman of Samaria. And just as a reminder... You have Judea, you know, here's Jerusalem, the holy city. You've got Samaria, and then up here you've got Galilee. John the Baptist is now you've got the Jordan. John is out here in the wilderness baptizing. Jesus comes out to him. John reveals him to be the Christ. Jesus helps out John a little bit until that becomes a hindrance to John. So Jesus sets off for Galilee, but before he does, he has to pass through Samaria. And that's where we find ourselves for right now, although by the end of today, he'll be in Galilee. <clears throat> He's, um, he's encountered this woman at the well. We talked about her already. Jesus talks to her, which again, uh, Jews do not do. They do not give even the, the, the most common pleasantries. You know, not, not the head nod, not the wave, not, you know, good morning, nothing to Samaritans. Uh, but Jesus does. In fact, he talks to her. And he promises her living water. And he reveals to her that that not only does she have no husband, but she's had several husbands. And the man she's with now hasn't even bothered to marry her. And she's she's amazed at this. So let's read uh, 25 through 30 here. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with the woman. But no one said, What do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. So you had this long discourse with this woman, and one of the interesting things is to look through all that red text there, all the, all the words of Jesus, and see how many times the word worship comes up. <clears throat> that is, of course, a chief sticking point between the Samaritans and the Jews. <clears throat> From the days of the divided kingdom until this time, the worship of the Samaritans and the worship of the Jews is very different. The Samaritans worship in a different in a different place on a different mountain. <clears throat> Their Bible only has five books, the books of Moses. They don't have the prophets. They don't have the wisdom writings. Um, they don't have the histories. Who doesn't? The Samaritans, yeah, and they worship God, but they don't worship Him according to to the Lord's word. That is the outward, the outward form of worship, which tells us something. It means that 
God actually cares about the outward form of worship. But this word worship appears a lot in the way that they talk. <clears throat> and Jesus tells her, those who worship God worship him in spirit and in truth. Meaning that this is not confined to a specific location in the new covenant, but rather is the life of all of the priests of God in the new covenant. Who is the priesthood of God in the new covenant? All the baptized. Right? You are priests under the new covenant. Meaning what? Do you offer sacrifices? Of course you do. All of your praise, all of your prayer, all of your good works, these are all the sacrifices of the priesthood of the New, the new Testament. Um, priests also pray for the people. Do you pray for people? You're being a priest. You're, you're doing the work of a priest. <clears throat> Just like Moses standing between Israel and God and praying for them, so also you as priests pray for others. Do you have access to God without an intermediary? Yes, you do. Because you have Christ, the one mediator between God and men. The woman confesses a very Samaritan knowledge of the Messiah. <clears throat> the Samaritans and the Jews both believe that Messiah is coming because even in the books of Moses you get the idea that Messiah is coming, right? In the Pentateuch, the Messiah is going to be described as a prophet like unto Moses. So the Samaritans believe that when Messiah comes, he's going to be a prophet. He's going to be a teacher. He's going to tell of God's will. The Jews, of course, their conception of Messiah is that of a king. Why? Well, if you've been coming on Wednesdays, you, you, you know that the promise made to David is maintained, God maintains it, not because the kings of Judah are good, Rehoboam was not, but because, for the sake of David. So that, that line of David is preserved for the sake of David, for the sake of the promise that God made to David, that there will be one of his descendants on the throne, right? So when the Jews are looking for Messiah, they are looking for a king. And so you can imagine the triumphal entry when Jesus enters into the city as a king, he's received as a king, he's proclaimed as a king. Ah, finally. But what do they expect? The kingdom is coming, good, but what's the kingdom to them? Political restoration of Israel. That's even what Jesus' Jewish disciples say at the ascension. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> that's, that's what they expect, not realizing, of course, he's restored the kingdom not just to Israel, but is now sending it forth to the nations. Nations meaning the, the, the Gentiles, the Goyim, the, those who are not of Israel, right? So she confesses her faith in Messiah. She knows that Messiah is coming, and, and she speaks like a Samaritan. Unsurprising, because she is one. I know that when, when Messiah comes, he will tell us all things, right? just like a prophet, a prophet like unto Moses. And then Jesus says, and I don't know why they chose to render the English this way because they're obscuring what he says, I am the one who is speaking to you. That is to say, I am is the one who is speaking to you. Now, if you only had the books of Moses, would you know that God's name is I am? Yes, Exodus chapter 3, that's the name that God gives to Moses from the burning bush. Whom, whom shall I say is sending me? I am who I am. As they're having this deep discourse, the disciples come back. They went into the city to buy food. Jesus has been going a long time. He's becoming weary. They're getting a little worried. They go into the city to buy food. They come back. And they see Jesus doing this thing that is not done. It's a very Germanic way of thinking. This is just not done. One doesn't do this. <clears throat> it's actually beneficial for society to think that way, by the way. Um, <clears throat> there are certain things that aren't done. 
This, however, is not because of anything good or wholesome. This is because of a hatred that goes back for a thousand years, almost. And a Jew does not talk or give pleasantries to a Samaritan. But what do the disciples say when they get back? They, yeah, they don't. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, they know that, if, that Jesus knows what he's doing. They know enough not to correct him. Whatever it is he, that he's up to with the Samaritan woman, let him cook, right? Um, he, he knows what he's up to. And so they, they don't interrupt him. They don't question him. They don't stop him. They do marvel. What's, what's he doing? Now, if you look at verse 28, not only does the woman go into town, but she leaves her water jar. So what's her state of mind when she goes into the town? Yeah, laser focused. She's in a hurry. She's in a hurry. She has one thing on her mind, and it is not her water jar. Forget the jar. She just meant Messiah. That one that they've all been waiting for, albeit their waiting has been dimmed. Their understanding of the Christ is dimmed. But nonetheless, they knew to wait for him. And so, I just found the Christ, who revealed himself to be a prophet. And to be fair to the Samaritans, is the Christ to be a prophet? Yes, he is the prophet like unto Moses. And so, she runs into the town to tell them. This is what faith does, by the way. When faith realizes what it's laid hold of, it's, it, it comes as naturally to the Christian as barking does to the dog. I found the Christ. I got to tell him. Yeah, she, she, she knows that he's not, not merely just any old prophet, as though there is such a thing as any old prophet. So she's understood. Right. Yeah. Well, not only that, but, but even in its own context, uh, without, without knowing the I am, um, Jesus just said he's the Christ. Compare her reaction to, the, to what we're going to see down in Judea. When Jesus reveals himself to be the Christ in Judea, in far subtler way, ways than this, he doesn't even have to say, I am the Christ. Just hinting at that in Judea, is going to get him stoned. Although he's going to perform some miracles to make sure he doesn't die except at the right time. He will allow himself to be killed, but only at the right time appointed by the Father. And so you'll see, especially in John, John does this a lot where Jesus is in Judea, he's ministering, he does some miracle or he teaches something, and it ends with, and here come the Pharisees or here come the Jews, and as soon as they realize what he's saying, they try to kill him. That's going to be a lot, when, when Jesus gets back to Judea, that's going to be the pattern. That's not the pattern in Samaria. Jesus reveals himself to be the Christ in a very bold and open way, and immediately she leaves the water jar, she runs back to the town to tell him. In other words, it's, it's not dangerous physically for Jesus to say this in Samaria, just like it's not going to be in Galilee. Verse 31, meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say yet there are four months or there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you do not, did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Hmm. So... The disciples are thinking earthly things, which is not, it's not bad. They care for Jesus. You're, 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 you're getting weary. You, you need to eat something. You know, eat. And Jesus turns the conversation away from earthly things to heavenly things. I have food to eat 
that you do not know about. And what do the disciples think that means? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he's stashed some bread in his pocket, or someone slipped him some food on the way or something. I mean, what, what are you talking about? Again, their mind is down here. They're like Nicodemus. Shall I enter into my mother and be born a second time? You know, or the woman at the well. You, you don't even have anything to, to draw water with. What are you talking about living water? You don't, you don't even have a jar. Jesus is up here, and the people he encounters are down here. Disciples, no different. Who, who slipped him some bread? But he's talking about a different, a different nature of bread, a different sort of thing, a, a heavenly sort of thing. What is that bread? Well, he tells us, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So what, what, is, what does God consider to be his food? Well, God is spirit. God doesn't require food to live. His food, that is what, what he lives for, is the return of the lost. Jesus is among all of these people. The Jews want nothing to do with them. The Samaritans are blinded. The Galileans, their mind is on other gods entirely. Because uh, this, is, this is Gentile territory here. All of them together lost in their own way. His mission, what the Father sent him to do, the work that the Father has given him to do and to complete, is the gathering in of the lost. That's, that's what, what, what he's about. That's the food that he lives by. And this is instruction for the disciples. This is going to be your work. Before he gets to that point, though, in 36, he mentions that already the one who reaps is receiving wages. Meaning what? When, when do reapers receive their wages? When they work. When they work. Right. That means the harvest has begun. And so the harvest is already happening. The lost are being gathered. And Jesus talks about, you are going to be reaping where others have sown. That means that some people's life has been sowing, but not seeing the growth and not seeing the harvest. Like whom? Well, like the prophets. The prophets sowed, which is to say they spoke the word of God, they revealed the word of God as, as the Lord gave to them. Did they see fruit? Sometimes. Jonah did. He didn't want to. But in many cases, they would speak the word, and the people rejected. And so the prophets are probably thinking during their, during their ministry, this is fruitless, meaning it's not bearing fruit. And yet, aren't we, 21st century American Christians, <clears throat> sustained by the, the word of the Lord, including the prophets? This work of harvest, this work of sowing and reaping, is going on multi-generationally. The prophets sow, the apostles are going to come in and reap. But it doesn't stop with the apostles. There are those who are going to come after the apostles. So pastors will speak, they'll preach. Ordinary Christians will witness. That's sowing. And if, you, if you've done the work of sowing, if you've preached or if you've um, you know, witnessed to an, a, a, a sinner, <clears throat> you know that it, it doesn't usually go like the woman at the well, where instantly they realize what they have and they run to tell others. It's, it's hard, hard work. Sometimes you might even think it's a drudgery, as, as I'm sure the prophets did. I mean, I don't know what his personality was like, but I can't imagine that Jeremiah just grew thrilled at the idea of again and again and again having to preach what was coming. Because what he had to preach that was coming was not, not favorable news in many ways. God's going to take this from you. God's going to destroy this. Yeah, it's, it's all the same work. So that if, if you reap where the prophets har- were, 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 uh, sowed, or 
if your church, for example, receives a member that came to the faith by hearing someone else preach, even maybe someone who might have been partially in error, Christ be praised. Now you might lead them out of that error, as Jesus will with the woman. Oh yeah, there, there was hatred. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, so the, the hatred of the, of the Jews and the Samaritans begins back in the 10th century BC, when after the reign of Solomon, the kingdom is divided as God promised Solomon it would. This is because of Solomon's sin of taking foreign wives and erecting idols to their gods. Because of that, 10 of the tribes are taken from Solomon and constitute their own northern kingdom called Israel, which will later be called Samaria after their new capital city. And um, there was war already in the, in, in the reign of the very first kings between Jeroboam of the northern kingdom and Rehoboam of the southern kingdom. And there's antagonism. Um, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's built up for almost a thousand years. And the thing of it is, is that uh, Jeroboam in the north, what was supposed to happen is he's going to reign, and then the people of Israel are going to come down into Judah and worship at the temple in Jerusalem. Jeroboam, to secure his political strength, builds temples in Bethel and Dan in order to prevent the, the Israelites from going down into Judah. But of course, uh, those temples are going to consist of two golden calves. <laughs> so... So the idolatry there is from the beginning. And of course, they also, they build idols all over the place. Although in Judah, it's described as they build idols all over the place in every, in every grove, every high place. Uh, so that they're both doing idolatry. But yeah, it's, it's been building up for 10 centuries. Yeah, thank you. That, yeah, that's, that's exactly the same thought. And, and if you notice, Paul says the one who plants, the one who waters, the one who reaps, they're all one. Just like Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, that it's the same work. Sowing, reaping, it's the same work. And so in, in a single church, you'll have sowing going on. You'll have Bible classes that are going. Maybe it's sowing, and maybe it's watering. Maybe it's there's growth happening, and this is just to continue that growth. And sometimes you'll have reaping. Someone comes in, and they, they want to join the church, and maybe they learn the faith from another sister congregation where someone else was sowing. It's, it's all the same work. And sometimes you'll have a member of this church who moves away for whatever reason and goes to another church, has the, has the church, the one church that we confess in the creed, has the church lost a member? No. The work continues. It also means then that when we think about our church in, in, in a broad way, in a long time span, we should try to set up ourselves for sowing the word and, and giving water that others down the line might reap. And the thing of it is, it's, it's a lot like farming in that sowing is, you put the seed in the ground and then what? You don't see much happening. When you plant the seed, it's in the ground, you don't see anything. It, it doesn't, I mean, aside from the rows looking straight, which is very important, um, you don't, you, yeah, you, you, you don't see anything. It doesn't look that impressive. There's, there's not anything you can really measure. You're at God's mercy. You pray. You, you do what you can. You, know, you, you, you keep out things that might endanger the crop. But you, you're, you're living at God's mercy. The harvest, on the other hand, is very measurable. You can measure all kinds of things about the harvest, and you can see it. You know, we took the kids to Floyd Data last weekend, and we saw all the great big bales and modules of cotton, and it's impressive. Wow, that much out of one field? I mean, the harvest is always impressive. But the thing of it is, there's no harvest if there's no sowing. And so all of that work together is one. And maybe, maybe we sow and another harvests. Maybe we harvest where another hasn't sown. If we harvest where another has sown, we are not to think of ourselves as, well, look at how good I am. At the same time, if we've sown but another harvests, we don't think of that as a loss. There's one church. And so all of that work is performed by prophets, apostles, pastors, ordinary Christians, and don't forget, God's angels. All of them working together in the same work. That's to be his work. So not only is Jesus revealing who he is, he's revealing what the disciples' work is going to become you're going to be doing a lot of reaping where others have sown. 
this, this tells you that the prophet's work was never in vain. Because again, I mean, we read these prophecies aloud even now, and we're sustained by that. 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. So she goes into the town. Again, put yourself in mind of the Samaritans. This woman comes in. Again, the testimony of a woman is not generally regarded well, not thought of much. She comes in, and of course, this isn't just any old Samaritan woman. This is the woman who has to go out at high noon because no one else is there at the well. She does not, she does not go into crowds because, she, because of her shame. And yet she goes into the town and tells them, I found the Christ. By the way, he's a Jew. That animosity is not necessarily one directional. As, as these kinds of feuds tend not to be. Uh, Jeroboam attacks Rehoboam just as much as the other. And when, when she comes and tells them, what happens? They don't go, one, they, they don't behave like these guys will and say, we got to kill him. Or we have to go find a charge to pin on him so that we can have him executed and make it look official. You know, what we might say in the catechism is a show of right. They don't laugh it off and go, ha, 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 you're crazy. They all run out. They run out to see him. It's ex- yeah, it's, it's, it's extraordinarily brave of her. She, do- she doesn't think about her shame. She doesn't think about her, her water jar. She doesn't, she doesn't worry that her testimony won't be received. That's a good lesson for us, right? Because isn't, isn't that probably the number one reason why we don't witness? Well, if I sow right now, I'm not going to harvest right now. You probably won't. It's very rare. I mean, this is written for our instruction, but, and it happened exactly as it says. But it's rare to find someone who receives the word of Jesus and immediately, it does happen, but it is rare. Most plants don't grow that quick where you can sow and reap in one action. So, she comes to the town, she brings the news of Jesus, they all come out to him. Yeah, in her position, she probably was really desperate. And so, yeah, she, she's willing to accept. And isn't that the case in the church? Yes. Where, where the word of the Savior is often received better by those who have very little than by those who have a lot. Why do I need a Savior? I have status, I have money, I have power, I have health, I have friends. And, and th- this is a great point, that the witness that she gives is, is a very small point. He told me everything I ever did. They come out to hear, and what they hear is greater than what she reported. Because he, he teaches them who he is. They invite him into the town. He stays for two days. Remember, he wasn't going to Samaria. He was traveling through. So he doesn't stay for long, because he's headed to Galilee. But he does stay, because he's finding... He's finding more of the lost. He's doing that work of sowing and gathering. And they hear the testimony of Jesus, and they make this great confession. It's no longer because she said, you know, he told me everything I ever did, but now it's because what we've heard for ourselves. We do this all the time when we witness. We don't necessarily lay out the entire dogmatic theology of Christianity to someone that we know that we want to get into church. We might. It might be necessary, but sometimes you're doing that, that work of come and see. You know, you, you give them something, they come and they hear more. That's legitimate. Because after all, we, we can't argue anybody into the faith. We can clear obstacles to the faith. Let me show you how the earth can be 6,000 years old. Let me show you how it's, it's necessary for the earth to have a creator. Let me show you why it's necessary and and true that there's only one God. But then they come and they hear more. 
that's that's very legitimate. That happens quite often in the in the Bible. Come and see. Come here for yourself. Then they hear for themselves, and they get even more to go on. So this is a fantastic reception in Samaria. All right, 43. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. So now we come to Cana. We've been to Cana before, right back in chapter 2. That's where Jesus manifested the first of his signs, which was the water into wine, right? Now, why Cana? Well, he, he knows he has people there who know what he's, who he is. This was, after all, the first of his signs that publicly announced his identity. Surely, people in Cana at this wedding told others, you're never going to believe what happened. Why did, but the obvious place to go in, in Galilee is not Cana, it's where? The obvious place for Jesus is Nazareth, right? That's where he grew up. That's his hometown. He's from Nazareth. Why doesn't he go to Nazareth? Did we read 43 and 44? Or did I skip it? I, I do that sometimes. Sorry. This is why. After, after the two days he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. Right? So these were Jews living in Galilee, because Galilee is, is Gentile territory, but there are settlements, cities of Jews living there. And if you're a Jew living outside of Judea, you go down to Jerusalem for the feasts. So they'd come to Jerusalem, they were at the feast, they saw Jesus, and they'd gone back and they'd remembered. Jesus doesn't go to Nazareth, though, because he says the prophet has no honor in his own hometown. I mean, that, 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 that bears truth. I don't know that it's a direct citation. It may be. I couldn't find it. It is nonetheless a truth. Because after all, if he goes to Nazareth, what's, what are people going to say? Yeah. Oh, Jesus ben Joseph. Yeah. Jesus son of Joseph. Carpenter. You're the carpenter's kid. Are we supposed to listen from you? So he, he doesn't bother in Nazareth. He comes to Cana. And there was an official, right? Some, some royal official. His son is ill. He hears that, that Jesus is coming. He knows who Jesus is. He knows that Jesus can do miracles. So he, he asks Jesus to do what? Heal his son. Not merely heal his son, but come and heal his son. The first time he asks this, Jesus says to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Is Jesus telling us, you should seek signs and wonders so that you can believe? No. There are many Christians who are very confused about this. He's not saying, you should seek out signs and wonders in order that you would believe. This is a rebuke of their faith, not praise of it. You, you people won't believe unless you actually see signs and wonders. In other words, he's saying their faith is weak. But again, notice, notice his temperament toward them. He's not enraged. He doesn't allow it to stop him. He is very, he's very gentle and patient with those whose faith is dim or weak or misinformed. That's useful for us because that's all, we're often all of those. There's much I don't know. There's much I, 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 I believe. I want to believe it. I struggle with believing it. 
I know it's true. I'm trying to internalize it. I'm trying to, to genuinely believe it, but I struggle. That's, that's every Christian. You're not the only one. And notice how Jesus is with people like that. People who are not utterly rejecting him, but struggling to believe. He's patient. He doesn't let it slow him down. It's not merely a rebuke of the faith. It's, it's teaching us what we should seek, which is to say, not signs and wonders. We're, the, the Christian faith is not a matter of going out and seeking out the miracles where they are to be found. Now, when miracles do come, and they do, we rejoice, we recognize them, and we give thanks to God for them. But we're not, we're not out looking for the latest signs and wonders. In verse 49, the official reveals that his understanding of Jesus' power is very limited. No, you have to come. You have to come to where my child is and physically be there so you can heal him. Now, you know, we know, this Jesus is God of what part of the earth? All of it. He's the Lord of all creation. Meaning, it's not necessary for him to physically locate himself somewhere close to us in order to do signs and wonders, to do, to do these miracles, right? Jesus is, after all, the Word. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he said, let there be, and there was. He didn't need to get down into creation to create it. He gets down into creation in order to redeem us. That's useful for you. Because after all, God is in heaven. I mean, he's, he's among us, to be sure. You pray to God all the time. You should. Yeah, that's, that's generally how healing works. The one doing the healing has to be close. He, right, he fills the heavens and the earth. He's, he's present in all places. That's one of his attributes. He's omnipresent, which is why it's not necessary for him to move his location from here to there. He is there with the boy. And so the man doesn't understand this. Come down, you, you know, walk to where my son is so that you can heal him. And Jesus tells him, go, your son will live. Centurion, the same thing back in, in Matthew chapter 8. This command of Jesus heals two souls, not merely the one. The boy is healed, as we're going to find out. The man is also healed of his ignorance. Jesus doesn't let his ignorance stop him. He commands that he go, meaning it's done. Your son will live. He doesn't tell him, well, give him this poultice or put on this salve or whatever. It's, your son will live. In other words, he's, he's already done the miracle. And so, at that moment, the man believed. Verse 51. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed in all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. So the first sign was done in Cana. The second sign, also in Cana. So the official asks, how's my son? The, the servants come to meet him. <clears throat> what a strange coincidence. Right? Except it's not. This is, also, this is also Jesus doing. He arranges for the servants to come meet the official on his way so that he can find out. They tell him, your son is recovering. He's getting better. And, and so the man knows to ask the right question. By chance, roughly when was it that my son started to get better? Oh, it was the seventh hour. That's when Jesus said, go, your son will live. In other words, this thing is most definitely from Jesus. He's the cause of this. And so he comes to believe, and now his whole household believes. 
why does this household believe? He spoke the word to them. He told them who Jesus is. Guess what, family? I went to go see Jesus. Remember that guy we heard about back at the feast? And I asked him to heal my son, and it was about the seventh hour, and that's when the, the son started to get better. And now the whole household believes. Again, another great example of how the faith gets shared. Excellent, excellent point. The father's job is to instruct the household, and that's exactly what he does. He teaches the household. That's, that's how the, the small catechism begins, right? As the head of the household, the, German, or the, the Latin word here, paterfamilias, or the German Hausvater, Hausfather, um, is to teach it to his household in a simple way. And so he instructs his household, and now they all believe. Questions on this part of the text? Okay, we'll take up John chapter 5 next week. I won't be here, but Pastor Schwizo has agreed to, to teach and preach for us next week, so we'll take up John 5 then. Uh, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.